All right, what's going on ladies and gentlemen? Josh here from Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern day renaissance man. And as you can see, I'm on my way to the gym. That's why I'm wearing this stuff. And as you can also see, I got myself, a, I got myself all cut up. Shit looks clean. Boom. And guess who did it? This guy. That's right. See, a lot of you guys don't know what it's like, but uh, I grew up. <laughs> I grew up uh, on the other side of the train tracks where you didn't get haircuts unless you cut your own damn hair. So for most of my teenage years, if I wanted to get a good fade or whatever, I had to do it myself. And nowadays, I just prefer doing it because most of the people I go and see, they um, they don't know what the fuck they're doing, <laughs> to be honest. No, it's not that. It's that they don't care enough about it, and then like half your hair they'll do right and the other half they'll do wrong. Or The other thing is too, it's much easier to be upset with yourself if you screw up than someone else. And especially when it comes to the beard. Um, Man, if somebody if somebody messed up my beard, it'd be game over. Game over. But you guys are probably wondering, like, okay, so what are we talking about today? Today, we're gonna talk about the difference between the mentor archetype and the divine archetype. And I actually, earlier today, I was editing some of our manuscripts because we're getting ready to push all of our material, all of our products that we have, we're getting ready to push them onto Audible. So I'm like cleaning things up and stuff like that. And I've, you know, I've actually seen this question a couple times uh, in various places. Sometimes I get asked the question, in uh, in emails, sometimes on YouTube, sometimes I see it as I'm doing some research or it's in another book. So I'm gonna try to clear that up here as hopefully within about 15 to 30 minutes. I'm really aiming for 15. And, but like I was saying, I actually did a podcast, which I'm gonna try this thing where I, okay. Is it there? All right, we'll see. Uh, I'm trying this new thing because of other people that I follow. Uh, if I did it right, you'll see a picture of the podcast and maybe there will even be a link. I'll leave a link down below. But okay, let me, un okay, now it should be gone, hopefully. But what I'm trying to do, or what I did in the podcast was I went on for like an hour, over an hour, about the similarities and the differences between a mentor and a goddess archetype. But for the purposes of this conversation, since it's for YouTube and there are, I have tons of YouTube videos on here that already explain the main similarities of, the, of these two archetypes, we're really gonna focus on the differences and maybe I'll do, if you guys want, go ahead and leave a, a, a leave a comment in the description below. And if you really want, I'll go over a video that only describes the similarities. That way we can keep it clean and it's not too long. And, um, and also if the, you guys have any other questions about the monomyth archetypes, plus of course, shameless plug, go ahead and check out the books that I've published on this. Um, I, I released a course last year and I'm about to actually do a, a huge discount on it. So if you're interested in that, go ahead and, and you can drop a comment and I'll send you a coupon for that. But um, all about the monomyth, things like that. And then while I'm thinking about it, don't forget to destroy that subscribe button if you haven't already. And that way you can check out all of my cool content. And if you want to know more about what I do uh, with Story Ninjas, you can check us out at www.story-ninjas.com. 
The dash is very important, story-ninjas.com. You don't wanna to go to some weird ninja site. You wanna to go to our site. Uh, so let's get into it. This is very important for storytelling and a lot of people get confused. And the one thing I wanna clarify, because it comes up in almost all videos, even the ones that I haven't done, people are wondering like, does the mentor, does that person have to be a male? And the answer is no. Does the goddess have to be a female? No, okay? The, the, the short answer is no. As a matter of fact, they can be whatever they want. And I talk about this in other books and I'm, I'm writing archetype, I wrote one archetype book so far, but I, I'm writing a whole bunch more. And it basically goes into this in depth, but your, your mentor can be male, it can be female. It, the mentor can be young, the mentor can be old, the mentor can be mentally stable or not. So uh, not a big deal. Also, the uh, they can be a robot. So they can be, a, you know, they can be technological. They could be a flower. They could be anamorphic, meaning like a, you know, like a werewolf or I don't know whatever. I mean, think of superhero movies. A lot of times you have like, they're these things like robots and stuff. So the, the, sh the short answer is no. They, either one of these characters can be male, female, cat, dog, purple, blue, doesn't matter. Okay. So don't get hung up on those little things because you're missing the most important thing, which is what is the thematic function that this character is fulfilling in the story, which is why they're an archetype in the first place, because they're performing a thematic function. Uh, so what are the differences? The key differences are that the divine, and, and by the way, I sometimes I will reference the goddess as the divine because it is gender neutral and I feel like it re that term really represents what the goddess truly is, this divine being. Um, they are usually more powerful than the mentor and they usually provide stronger tools to the hero than the mentor provided. And they usually are have more insight into the journey than the mentor and uh, they also they they will provide shelter which the mentor does as well but this usually happens during the you, you got to think of, get, you got to give it a little bit of context okay so like when the hero meets the mentor it's in the beginning of the story they haven't gone on the journey so the hero hasn't faced many issues. At that point, they're just learning about the special world and they're training. So while there might be conflict, it's not that deep. But by the time they meet the divine figure, the goddess figure, they're in the they're in the, the deep shit of the story. They're they're they've just finished the road of trials stage. And now they're about to go through the transformation stages. So this is very, very important. They're about to go into the uh, like the innermost cave and all this other stuff. So um, as the story progresses, so do the challenges and therefore the power and the significance of the individuals that they meet also start to stack and raise. And um, so what we find is that in, in almost every aspect, the divine figure is just an amplification of the mentor and of the powers of that individual. And I'll, I'll give you a few examples before we go here. But I would say the biggest difference is in the directive of the mentor compared to the... Uh, the divine. The mentor is going to give a call to adventure. Now the hero will have received the call earlier on and kind of thought about it, but not really made up his mind. But when the mentor gives their call, sorry, I got something in my eye. Um, 
that's the one that is the true, it's like what I like to call the mentor's call to adventure or the official call, because if the hero doesn't accept that one, it's probably they're, they're gonna end in tra tragedy. They're, they may reject it first and then later on accept, but if they never accept, those stories almost always lead to tragedy because the hero is then stuck in this mundane world that they can't get out of and they're, they're, uh, they're stuck in their flawed mindset and that leads to, that's essentially their fatal flaw. The directive that the divine figure gives is what we call the impossible task. So it's like, it's a deeper call to adventure. Um, so for example, um, in the beginning of the story, the call to adventure that comes from the mentor might be like, hey, come with me to the special world so we can go um, get this boon or whatever, or just come with me to the special world and then we'll be done then. But then stuff happens in between, uh, particularly during the belly of the whale and the road of trials that change things in the story. And now they're up against a much bigger issue than what they thought. And that's why they go and they meet the divine figure. Sometimes it's on good terms, sometimes it's on bad terms, sometimes it's neutral terms. But the divine figure is gonna say, actually, if you wanna solve this problem, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to do this really difficult thing that we call the impossible task. And what the impossible task is, is something that in the world of your story seems like like nobody would believe it could ever be done. And I promise I'm gonna, uh, I'll give you some examples right now actually. Um, in Clash of the Titans, Perseus goes to see these like three hag witches and believe it or not, they represent the divine. I explained that in more detail in the podcast, but uh, bottom line is you can have you can have um, a fake ally mentor or you can have mentors and divines that are not aligned with the hero on every aspect of the of the journey so they could even be antagonistic to the hero and sometimes you might have a divine figure or a mentor who seems antagonistic at first but ultimately becomes an ally. That's what we would call a fake opponent. Um, again, another, that's really for another day, but um, Perseus meets these witches and they say, hey, in order to defeat the Kraken in the movie, in, in real myth, it's a different creature, but it's, it's basically a, a giant water titan. In order to defeat this thing, you're going to have to cut the head off of Medusa. Okay. Well, good luck with that because Medusa is a badass Gorgon that turns everybody to stone when you see her. So that's impossible. So that's that's an impossible task. If you look at um, Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, if you only look at that story in the perspective of the first book, not the wider story, Elrond serves as the divine being in that story and overall just for context overall Galadriel serves as the divine being for the overall story that's a whole nother topic but uh Elrond the divine or the task that he gives is basically you guys have to get this ring to Mordor and destroy it which seems like an impossible task and then even though she doesn't necessarily fulfill uh, Galadriel doesn't necessarily fulfill the divine thematic functions in that particular book. Like I said, in the overall trilogy, she does. And the key here is when Frodo meets her for the first time, she reinforces and she even makes it more difficult because she's like, she's basically like, hey, you can see now that... Um, that you like you can already start to sense that some of the people in the fellowship are being tempted by the ring. The fellowship is breaking. It is already begun. He will try to take the ring. 
You know of whom I speak. One by one, it will destroy them all. And essentially, after they're done with their conversation, Frodo realizes, like, I have to do this on my own. I have to go to Mordor on my own. I'm probably going to die. At this time, he doesn't know that Sam's going to come with him. But it just makes the impossible task seem that much more impossible when, when uh, she talks about it. In Star Wars, A New Hope, the impossible task is uh, you, you are going to... Uh, the impossible task... It's insinuated, and these these are really good when when the impossible task is insinuated. Um, Luke received the call to adventure initially from Leia's message. Then he got the directive or the official call from Obi Wan, who is the mentor, to go on this adventure. And then finally they do. Then they get tr stuck in this tractor beam. Uh, they sneak aboard the Death Star un unfound and then Obi-Wan goes to, to shut down the tractor beam while Luke and Han discover blueprints and then eventually, not the blueprints, they discover that uh, Leia is actually in the detention center. And so even though she doesn't say, hey guys, come and save me, there's they decide on their own that they need to go rescue Leia. So it is insinuated that um, they are doing this impossible task, which is sneaking through the Death Star in stormtrooper armor, going to like the most dangerous level, which is the, de the, the detention center, in order to save Leia. That is an impossible task. And it's insinuated that it, it's in, it was for the, um, the divine figure, which in the first movie, Leia represents that. Leia represents the goddess figure or the divine figure. In the overall movie, it's Yoda. And so Yoda's divine task or impossible task is, um, it's also somewhat implied. Luke must enter the cave during his training. And when he does, he's warned not to bring anything in. And when he goes into that cave, he faces what he believes to be Vader. It's actually like a force vision. And when he defeats the force vision, we get a foreshadowing because we see that the face is actually Luke. And at first, like everybody's like, wow, that's really trippy. What does that mean? Later on, when Vader reveals he's his father, now things start to make sense. And what we find, because again, it's a trilogy but what you really want to look at is the the two latter movies almost as one giant movie. Um, Yoda, Yoda basically gives his impossible task is uh, you're going to have to face your father and defeat him. You're going to have to face Vader and defeat him, which in that story world, in the galaxy of Star Wars, Vader is the top dog. He is the main mofo. And so you ain't gonna beat him because he destroyed the Jedi. And I mean, like, you know, you just don't do that. So already that's crazy. And then to top it off that Luke later finds out that Vader is his father, which is this person that he's always wanted to meet, always had admiration for kind of, you know, unintentionally. Now it just adds an extra layer of conflict and tension because it's like, there's no way he's gonna kill his father. And, um, and it just makes the resolution that much better when we see what happens in the third film. So that is, um, so that is a really big, um, thing is the divine figure gives this impossible task and the impossible task is going to send the hero in the direction of the innermost cave. Now, the innermost cave is kind of elusive to people who are just starting to study the monomyth because it, it represents a couple things. It's called the innermost cave because at that point when the hero reaches that area, he's going to have to face his innermost flaw, his innermost demons. And so it's metaphorical in the sense that it's a, a cave 
Although many times this is in film and in books, this is represented by a dark place, a cave-like place, a dungeon-like place, a place that one must descend down into. And now, if you never realized that before and you start to read more books and, and rewatch shows or something, you're gonna see, oh my gosh, this happens all the time. There's a descent into darkness. I mean, that's actually uh, what some people would call this, a descent into, dar into darkness. Um, when this happens, it's, so like I said, the impossible task propels the hero towards that descent into darkness, into the innermost cave. And like I said, once they're in the cave at the, at the darkest point, that's when they're gonna face their innermost demon. And this demon is going to be represented by an actual character, it's an archetype. We call this a stage archetype. And they're gonna face what's called the dragon. Now the dragon in mythology took many forms, a, a literal dragon, a monster, a, a demon, a, um, what's the other word? Oh, why am I not calling A minotaur, okay? And so um, I'll just give you a couple off the top of my head. We, we talked about Medusa, okay? That's one. And keep in mind, this monster, this demon, they represent, they're the physical representation of the hero's uh, fatal flaw, psychological flaw, the thing that's holding them back. And uh, I'm not gonna go into detail on all of them. There's one in particular that I think hits at home and we'll just use that one. So Medusa is a good example. The monster in the trash compactor is an example for Luke in the first film of, in the first uh, original trilogy film, A New Hope. That monster that pulls him under the water. Um, the Balrog that Gandalf faces is a perfect example. The, let's see, there, there are, I mean, there's a ton. And, and I already named some mythological ones like the Minotaur and, and dragons. The one I wanna bring up is a dragon, it's Smaug. He, he is really a great depiction of what everything this archetype should be um, because Smaug, he represents Thorin's, because Thorin is the, the kingly hero in A Hobbit. He represents Thorin's um, fatal flaw. A dragon is this creature that is full of desire and full of power and wants to possess things in a pornographic way. And por pornography in this sense is like when you, it's a fantasy of something that you wanna have and possess even though you could never use it. You could never really have use for it. And that's why dragons in mythology are depicted as these creatures that, that desire gold and uh, riches and virgin, like a harem of virgins and things like that. It's the representation of uh, like a fantasy because you could, no one person could ever use all of that. And it completely represents, in a symbolic way, Thorin's major flaw. Is that he, he has that same dragon's disease, which they even talk about in the story. Um, and, and so even though he slays that dragon, which is a foreshadowing of Thorin at the end, becoming truly hitting his hero state, um, he struggles with it. And that's very important for the story. So um, that mission that the divine gives, it's very important because it propels the hero into these stages that are the transformation stages. And if he doesn't go through those transformation stages, he's never gonna hit apotheosis, AKA self-actualization, which happens at the end of the transformation stages. And it's really critical that the hero does in order for them to fulfill the rest of the narrative and thematic functions that, that are to follow. So um, that pretty much sums it up. Like I said, the, the, the main things, I'm not gonna go over them all again, but the divine is a 
higher amplification or just a stronger being, if you want to think about it in that sense, than the mentor. And a lot of times they are of the same faction. They don't have to be. And a lot of times the mentor reports to the divine figure in some manner, shape, or form. And a lot of times the mentor might even be a descendant or a servant of the divine. Um, the divine usually has what would be considered like godlike powers uh, equal to the father or aka the parent figure in the film or or in the story and the narrative and um and so that's easy to understand if you're looking at it from a fantasy mythological or science fiction type of way but if you're looking at it from more of an urban story like a romance or something it would be think about it like this and actually this is this is a way i, I like to think about archetypes in general is that the uh the mentor is usually like the age of a father or an uncle to the hero and then the divine figure is usually the age so so just to recap the mentor is like a parent's age to the hero and then the divine figure is like a grandparent's age to the hero so if you're looking at an urban story like a romance or something like that it could be like the mom or the aunt is the is the mentor and then the grandmother is the divine figure and that's that's a pretty good way or you could say like uh, the uncle and the grandfather uh, I think that's a really good way to, to consider these uh, individuals and um, again I'm not gonna go into detail but if you think about the ranking of Jedi about who trained who um, in Star Wars like that's pretty much what you have. You have like a grandparent, parent, uncle type relationships most of the time. But that's all the time we have today. I kept it to 20 something minutes, under 30. Woot, got it. If you have any questions, again, drop them down below. Go ahead and smash that subscribe button. And if you know anybody who writes who might find this interesting or helpful, send it to them. If you want to learn more, Again, you can check us out at www.story-ninjas.com. We have lots of books and series, and we're about to enter into the Audible domain. But uh, So you can check all that stuff out. But until next time, this has been Josh Coker. Josh Coker. Josh Coker. A.K.A. Josh Miss Prime. I'm also on all the social medias. And I'm signing off for Polymathics, the YouTube channel that helps you become a modern-day renaissance man. Take it easy.